Good evening. I would like to call to order the June 10th, 2019 Lake Washington School Board meeting. So please let the record reflect that all board members are present. And with that, I will now entertain a motion to approve the June 10th agenda. So moved. Second. It has been moved by Director Carlson and seconded by Director Sage that we approve the agenda. All those in favor, please signify by voting aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. So tonight we have a variety of recognitions, so we will start with um, our scholarship. So Dr. Staben, will you begin? I will, and I am looking for, there she is, Mindy Lincecombe, if you would come up. Lin Mindy is our Lake Washington PTSA Council President this year. And even before she begins um, with our scholarship awards tonight, I just want to express our appreciation. Mindy serves our district in so many roles in addition to PTSA, and she is somebody um, who is a great sounding board for us as we're thinking about things from a parent perspective, and she just has a real heart of service. And so, Mindy, thank you for all that you do. And we are looking forward to hearing about our scholarship award winners tonight. Thank you, Dr. Stavum, school board members, staff of the district. Um, thank you for this opportunity this evening to recognize some well-deserving uh, staff and students. Uh, I'd also like to welcome those students. Uh, we've almost, we're recognizing 15 students here tonight um, and their families who have joined them. Congratulations, and we're pleased to be able to celebrate your success in this way. Um, each year, the Lake Washington PTSA Council is able to offer uh, scholarships to graduating seniors as well as some um, district staff for their continued education. Um, this year, our, our graduating senior scholarships are $1,250 each. Uh, those are funded by a variety of ways. A couple of them are funded directly by direct donations from uh, partner organizations. One, uh, the Bates Scholarship is funded by the Lake Washington Education Association, and we're very thankful for that. Um, the, but the vast majority of those scholarship funds are raised by our 43 PTAs across our district, and next year we'll have 44 PTAs contributing to that effort, uh, both through direct donation and also a basket auction that we hold here in the fall uh, and near the holiday season. And we're very thankful for all the participation from all of our PTAs that make these scholarships possible. Um, this evening, I'd like to introduce our scholarship committee uh, chaired by Yumna Green, and then scholarship committee members Nikki Bolt and Tara Hempstead and Brandy Comstock, who you'll all hear from later as they introduce different scholarship recipients. Uh, Jay Pulicode was also part of that committee, but she was unable to be here tonight. So uh, with that, we are ready to move on to recognize our two staff and 15 students. Thank you very much, Mindy. And yes, thank you students for heading out to that corner of the room. <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Before we actually hand out the scholarships tonight, I'd like to take a moment to um, thank some key individuals who have helped to make our scholarship program a huge success this year. I'd like to start with our college and career specialists and our counselors at all of our high schools. You are valued partners in publicizing our scholarships and encouraging students to apply. I'd also like to thank all of our PTSAs that Mindy just mentioned, um, our council as well as our local units, the Lake Washington Education Association for your generous support in funding our program. I'd like to thank Irene Newman and Liz Hedreen for their historical background and their support behind the scenes this year. And finally, I'd like to extend a sincere thank you to our scholarship committee members and all of our scholarship judges. These individuals spent many, many hours carefully considering each of our applications and making sure that the eventual winners were truly worthy of these um, scholarships. So thank you very, very much. Okay, so without further ado, I will start with our staff scholarships. Our first uh, scholarship recipient is Emily Rorty from Audubon Elementary. Emily has taught kindergarten Oh, and Emily, you can walk on over and Mindy will hand your certificate to you. <laughs> Emily has taught kindergarten at Audubon Elementary for two years. She's worked in arts administration before discovering her passion for education. While earning her master's in teaching, she has worked as a pre-kindergarten teacher, as well as a kindergarten and first grade science specialist in Washington, DC. She is excited to return to the East Coast this summer to develop her teaching practice in reading and writing by attending the Reading and Writing Institute at the Teachers College at Columbia University. Our second staff scholarship 
um, goes to Janae Shuffles at Tesla STEM High School. She's unable to be with us tonight because she's in Tampa busy grading AP language um, answers or, yeah, exams. <laughs> um, so I'll just read a little bit of her bio before moving on. With 14 years of secondary teaching under her belt, Janae has taught English and AP language at Tesla STEM High School for six years and is the proud parent of two Eastlake High School graduates. She's a Powell Fellow with the Holocaust Center for Humanity in Seattle, where she continues to participate in ongoing professional development. She was invited to be a guest of Yad Vashem in Israel this July to complete an advanced teaching seminar with them. It'll be her first international trip, and this scholarship will help her learn more about Israeli and Arab culture while she's there. Our next scholarship is the Dr. L. E. Scar Scholarship. This is specifically for a student that is uh, attending a two-year or a vocational or technical college. And this year's winner is Taylor Rickles. Ta <laughs> Taylor's dream is to make a difference in the world. He loves to learn new things and has an impressive list of accomplishments and activities. His volunteer history includes being a search and rescue volunteer, a football staff volunteer, a special needs tutor, a volunteer babysitter at a neighborhood church, and more. In addition, Taylor has played baseball, served as captain of the football team, and worked more than 30 hours a week in an effort to save up money for his college education. Taylor will be attending Cascadia College in the fall, where he will be pursuing an associate's degree in business. Our next uh, scholarship winner is our education scholarship. Um, and this is the scholarship that Mindy was talking about that's funded by the Lake Washington Education Association. And this year's winner is Samantha Ellis. <laughs> Unlike most kids, Samantha has known since the first day of third grade that she wanted to become a teacher with a mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother who are all dedicated teachers, it is no surprise that she says that teaching is in her blood. For the past four years, she has volunteered weekly in a second grade classroom at Juanita Elementary, where she teaches students the basics of American Sign Language. She's an avid flute player and swimmer, and she's an active member of her school's chapter of the National Honor Society. Samantha will attend Whitworth University in Spokane, Washington this fall. At, at this point, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Tara Hempstead, and she will be announcing the first of the Merit Scholars. And we'll start out with East Lake, Christine Lee. Strong academics, consistent success and honors, advanced placement courses, and commitment to Excel describe Christine's time at Tesla STEM. Among her many awards and achievements, Christine is a National Merit Finalist, a STEM Scholar in Technology, an AP scholar with distinction, was voted outstanding delegate at the 2019 Washington State Model United Nations Conference, and is co-president of her senior class. She views cultivating a culture of kindness at her school as her most important accomplishment. Her AP language and composition teacher has absolutely no doubt that she will change the world. Christine plans to attend Rice University this fall. And we have Sonika Tayad, and I guess she's not here. National Merit finalist Sonika Tayad excels in the classroom and community. She performs with the Tanjavar Dance School, volunteers at Seattle Veterans Hospital, and is resource creator and director of technology at Redify, was instrumental in developing an app to combat cyberbullying and online hate speech. Sonica has found her voice through the power of poetry and believes that her poetry has become one of the most transformative forces in her life. Those who know her best describe her as resilient, determined, and ambitious, and as a highly capable and hardworking leader. Sonica will be attending the University of Washington this fall. And for Redmond, we have Grace Kim. Grace's accomplishments throughout high school are exceptional. Not only has she has an amazing course load filled with AP courses, but is also a very well-rounded student. She participates as a leader in multiple clubs, 
Math Club Secretary, Science Olympiad, Vice President, Bullet Club Journal Club present, President. She's also a flute section leader in the wind ensemble and an insightful artist. What is truly outstanding, though, is her leadership and passion around science and math. She realized a need to share her enthusiasm with others and created Girls Rock at STEM seminars. This organization engages middle school girls to enjoy and discover a love for science. It is no surprise that Grace will be attending the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the fall. And Sarah Raza. Sarah clearly has a passion for helping others and leading by example. Her coursework was very challenging throughout high school and she tackled it phenomenally. She also served as host of the Buzz Radio Show, treasurer of the ASB, and president of the Speech and Debate Club. Furthermore, Sarah is founder and CEO of a 501c3 organization called AWARE. AWARE's mission is to provide a more inclusive environment at school for students with special needs. Her goal is to ensure all students can participate in every kind of school event. With the establishment of AWARE chapters in three different school districts across our state, Sarah has shown that she not only makes a difference for students in her high school, but also for over 500 high school students across Washington State. Sarah plans to attend Stanford University in the fall. Our next recipients are from the Juanita Learning Community. The first is Angelina Lum. Angelina is a hardworking and thoughtful student, maintaining excellent grades at Juanita High School, attaining high achievements in her extracurricular activities, which include tennis, swimming, piano, and more, and serving the community through various efforts, including Mexico Mission Trek. She is proud of her Korean roots and American upbringing, which help her create an environment of unity and harmony around herself. Her teachers and guides appreciate her commitment, enthusiasm, desire for deeper understanding, positivity, and can-do attitude. Her humility and delightful personality make her very deserving of this scholarship. Angelina will be attending the University of Washington in the fall. And Maria Harsvik. Maria is a student at International Community School. Her exceptional grades, along with a multitude of extracurricular activities, are noteworthy. Being a member of the National Honor Society, Future Business Leaders of America, and International Club President are only some of her accomplishments. She is a Gold Award recipient of the Girl Scouts of America and very passionate about helping other children develop their love for STEM. Her teachers find her to be extremely motivated, dedicated, and willing to undertake challenges. She has interned at the Center for Infectious Disease Research and exhibited her passion for science as well as strong work ethic. This scholarship will be useful in achieving her goals as well as inspiring other students. Maria plans to attend Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. And from the Lake Washington Learning Community, Taryn Chisholm. Taryn has balanced academic success with participation in sports and in community service activities. She maintained a 4.0 GPA with a rigorous course load, leading to a Certificate of Excellence for Science awarded by the American Association of University Women. In addition, she has participated in soccer, track, leadership, and has been a member of Campfire since kindergarten, reaching the ultimate award possible, the Wohilo. This award celebrates perseverance, goal setting, work ethic, commitment to community service, and leadership. Taryn plans to attend Santa Clara University in the fall. And Hesed Jung. Hesed has made an outstanding 4.0 GPA with a rigorous course load while participating on the tennis team, where she serves as the captain of the team, and working as a tennis coach and in a bakery. One of Hesed's biggest accomplishments is organizing a charity volleyball tournament that helped collect clothing to donate to the homeless, a cause that Hesed is passionate about. She is also very active in her church, leading Sunday school classes and working with children with special needs. Her English teacher describes her as the epitome of a well-balanced student, excelling academically, thriving athletically, and succeeding personally, and has no doubt that Hesed will be a stellar addition to the student body at the University of Washington this fall. <laughs> and for the Perseverance Scholarship Award, Mira Mayhew, 
This year's winner of the Lake Washington PTSA Council Perseverance Scholarship is truly an exceptional student. Despite having to overcome personal struggles and family hardship, Mira has had great academic success while at Emerson High School and in the Bellevue Run College Running Start program. Whether she is challenging herself with advanced courses in Japanese, being honored with a certificate of excellence from the American Association of University Women of Washington State, or taking part in activities at her school or with local youth groups, Mira strives to reach her goals and chart her own course. Mira will be attending Bellevue College in the fall. I'm just going to take a moment of personal privilege and say perseverance and turnaround scholarships are like my favorite. Okay, so um, I get the honor of announcing the turnaround scholarship winner. So Kyle Rachel, the twists and turns that life has thrown at Kyle over the past several years are enough to crumple the strongest of people, but Kyle has channeled his experiences into a map forward for the life that he desires. He's continuously improved his GPA every semester as he has discovered the power of being organized, focused, hard work, and dedication. Kyle has balanced his academic improvements, continuously increasing his, gosh, I lost it, continually increasing his achievements along with a dedication to soccer, a number of community service activities, and several jobs. Kyle will be attending the University of Washington this fall. So our first at-large award this year goes to Hayes Rabacher. The LWPTSA Council is thrilled to offer Hayes this at-large scholarship. This, we are honoring a student who has achieved success academically, athletically, and personally. Hayes is a dedicated and award-winning swimmer. He has a long history of working as a lifeguard and swim instructor at Strattonwood Swim Club. He has an autism spectrum disorder, but hasn't let that define him. Rather, he eloquently describes his resolute determination to collect tools for his toolbox to make it through this journey of his life. Tools he's collected such as self-advocacy, stepping outside of his comfort zone, patience, and grit. In the words of his high school chemistry teacher, Hayes is an, an incredibly positive leader with a ferocious work ethic. Hayes will be attending Boise State University this fall. <laughs> Preeti Das is an exceptional student. She is a member of UNICEF Club, a member of multiple national honor societies, science, math, computer science, to name a few, an executive board member of the Eastlake Indian Student Association, and vice president of her school's key club. She is also a cultural dance teacher, a flute teacher, an accomplished flute player, a drum major, and the producer of a charity show that raised over $9,200 for UNICEF. Preeti has achieved all of this while challenging herself with numerous AP courses and maintaining an impressive 3.984 GPA. Those who know Preeti describe her as humble, gracious, generous, organized, and eager to learn and grow. Preeti will be attending the University of Washington in the fall. And now we have Jillian Jackson. Jillian is the president of Eastlake High School's speech and debate team. And under her leadership, the team has won a record-breaking number of trophies. I think she said 19 in one year. She is also an American Heart Association advocate for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, a member of Link Crew, Drama Fest writer for Eastlake Student Directed Productions, a National Honor Society member, and a Washington State PTA Reflections Award of Merit winner in literature. She has maintained a 4.0 GPA throughout high school while challenging herself with both AP and honors courses, all while dealing with an OCD diagnosis. 
Jillian plans to attend Lewis and Clark College in the fall. Congratulations to all of our winners. Um, I'd like to, in closing, thank Diane Jenkins and LWSD, as well as the PTA Council for the lovely snacks in the back of the room. I'd also like to honor all of the adults in the room that have had a part in shaping and guiding these students on their pathways to success. And I'd like to congratulate these scholarship award winners and to let you know that we're super proud of your accomplishments and we're really excited about the path that you're about to embark on. So congratulations, and please join us out in the lobby for a final group photo. Thank you. <laughs>while the board goes out to join that lovely group of students for a quick photo, I would like to <laughs> present you with just a small token of our appreciation for your role as PTSA president this year, and hopefully you can find a wonderful spot for this to continue to grow in your garden or on your deck, and think of all of the ways that you have brought color and growth and beauty to our district through your role. So thank you, Mindy. We appreciate you.
All right, well, thank you for that little break. It was great to have that moment to chat with the students and have that picture done, so appreciate your patience. So we will now continue on with our next recognition, which is for the 2019 Innovation Program funding recipients. And I am going to invite Dr. Heather Sanchez, Director of Accelerated Programs Choice and Innovation to come forward. And as Heather comes up, we're also going to see a video made by our own John Knorr, um, highlighting some of our schools who received our innovation program funding this year. And I have to say, um, I love that this was in place. This was in my past life and in a lot of districts um, as a way of really inspiring people to be able to kind of pursue some of the things that they're interested in doing in a classroom and opening up opportunities for our students. So thank you for the work that goes into doing this. And with that, let's watch the video of all these wonderful things. Okay, thank you, Dr. Stavum and members of the board and uh, welcome community. And what a tough act to follow with the scholarships. What an, uh, what an amazing, and I remember thinking the same thing last year, but what an amazing group of students. Um, it just is so impressive. So um, I'm Heather Sanchez, Director of Accelerated Programs, Choice and Innovation. I have the distinct pleasure of having some very um, esteemed and talented school members here this evening to talk about their innovation grants. It's probably one of the highlights of my year because I get to give people money <laughs> and they get to go forth and do amazing things with it. So I have just a, a brief overview and then we have a highlight video and then they're gonna come up very briefly and just tell you in person what's so exciting to them about their grant because each one is unique. So this is our second year of having innovation grants. And the purpose really is to, um, to spark creativity, growth, and innovation in our district. It's part of our core values. It's part of our mission and vision. And this is the second year we've done it. And I can say no two grants have been the same. So each, each school that has got a grant and received a grant has done something slightly different with it. All of them very creative and innovative. So the process was just very briefly uh, that any, any school in the district can apply for an innovation grant each year. And so school teams with their principal think of something that's an innovative idea that will really help them move the needle in their school and then they write a grant application for it. That is submitted to me and myself along with a team that includes other central office administrators, parents, teachers, principals, review all of them. And those are decisions are made by January of each year and we work double time to get the schools their money so that they can get to work and then they begin implementing. And so these schools that are here with us this evening received their funding in February of this year, and they've been, and all three of the grants are really quite different from one another, as you'll see, and they've all been hard at work. And then here we are to celebrate the hard work. So our recipients this year are Ben Rush Elementary School with an innovation program grant called Building Home to School Connections, Ella Baker Elementary School, Creating Change Makers, Integrated Units of Study Focused on Service Learning, and Finn Hill Middle School, Tools for Creating Student Models of Science Phenomenon. And on that note, now I'm gonna cue, I'm gonna show you something first. So we have a video that John Knorr in the back there, the wizard behind the curtain um, from communications helped me put together. And uh, he's been a great partner in this project, I have to say, in all of the videos. So I'm just going to the district webpage and I'm going to innovation. And we have the highlight video there, but I wanted to show you this badge here. As of today, you guys, we have also put this badge on your school web pages. So surprise. <laughs> So I'll show you, and I just had the video put up today too so they wouldn't watch it and somebody already watched it, right? <laughs> but so if we go to the elementary schools and we go to Ella Baker Elementary School, they now have a new badge up here. And so each school that has received innovation program funding has a badge that takes, that takes back here, but anybody who visits the Ella Baker webpage will now see your badge. So congratulations to each, uh, each program. And then we have uploaded the highlight video for this year. This is a brief bio. This is a brief overview of each of the funded programs for this year. Each one of them will have their own video, and that's in process. But the first thing we work on is the highlight reel, which we're gonna take just a couple minutes to watch now. How do we 
take reading, writing, and math, and science and social studies and create powerful units that students engage in. The goal of teaching is to serve kids the very best you can and to teach them the very best you can. And we can't do that if we don't understand a student's background or a family's culture. Well, innovation is a mindset. It's uh, allowing people to look inside themselves, find purpose and passion, and be able to create things that they wouldn't have thought of originally. So this um, grant allows me to really reach out to parents and families in more unique ways. I don't have three and a half thousand dollars in any budget that I've got to actually spend it on that equipment other than the main running of a science lab throughout the year. And I think the the generosity, essentially, of having that money for our district is phenomenal. A preposition is anywhere a mouse can go. We are at a school here with a really diverse student population. We have over 30 different languages spoken. Hey, show me how many sounds you hear. The Innovation Grant is something that I wrote to help increase our home-to-school connections and support our culturally responsive teaching. This allows me to really reach out to parents and families in more unique ways. Both the home visits I've been on in the last month, we've brought a game and we just sit with the kids and, and play a game. There's no academic expectation when we're in their home. For me, two things, if I have to tell you from the, from the culture when I was growing up initially in India. The other part of it is the family panel, so bringing parents in and then letting them talk about their deep culture. Make friends with everyone. This panel itself here, right here, is a great example of how uh, we are involved in our, you know, child's education, how parents' input is taken into consideration. So he can start appreciating all these different cultures. It's less about the families understanding the school and more about us as a staff understanding our families and our students and learning more about them. So your ears are doing this when I'm speaking. What I wanted to apply for was specifically uh, to get equipment that allows kids to monitor both motion and forces. What it is, it's just a single pulse like that. We've looked at different ways of working with science and how it works with our uh, eighth grade class. So with all the technology that we have, we were missing some pieces that would allow students to be more hands-on. What we had been using in the past is, uh, which is great, standard stopwatches with, with measuring distance. But when you're talking about a small change in, in the speed or velocity of an object, you really need something that's accurate. This is a motion sensor, and so any small changes that you've got with this, um, from an item walking, moving, a car moving at it, what have you, will give you instant and very accurate measurements of its distance, uh, the time where it was at, and because of that, its velocity, and then a change in its velocity, too. When we start talking about digital waves, it's really important to see the difference between those two. For students to actually remember what they're learning, I think, and also to make applications to it, they really got to experience it. They've got to be able to uh, set the parameters for what they're looking at, come up with the question that they're after, look at that question and say, what's the evidence I need to actually prove this question is going to be right, and if it's right. We can still teach the unit without the probes. Sure. However, if you look long term, and, and what engages students in their learning is the hands-on piece. And when they can actually do it and show their own data from table to table or group to group and then present it, it's their findings. This isn't something that uh, is going to last one year, two years, or four years. This should last at least a decade, if not two decades. Recyclables, it's really important that we don't put food in there. Well, at Ella Baker Elementary, we believe in empowering change makers who know themselves, know how to collaborate with others, and how they can make an impact on the world. Composting, mm. and then focus on teaching the younger levels. So we wrote this grant in order to support our mission. Um, the grant is focused around um, supporting teachers on creating project-based units and then also resources for the project. The reality of implementation, there might be some things that change. This grant gave us the opportunity to have a project-based learning consultant who has come to our school. Everybody needs the creativity. Everyone needs to be an innovator. Spent time with our entire certificated staff and now is spending a couple of days working with small groups of teachers to create really powerful units of study for students. We're in the middle of implementing project-based learning, but right now we're refining it and make going deeper. Uh, this innovation grant is gonna provide us with the resources, though, to do some of the things that we may not have been able to do. <laughs> So
So this is such exciting and invigorating work that these schools are engaging in. And as you can see, each, each program is different, but they're all innovative. So on that note, I'm gonna take a few moments to have each program come up and just in your own words, what, what, what are you most excited about, about this innovation program? What, what has made the biggest difference for your school? But before we do that, can we just give them a big round of applause, all of them? <laughs> All right, guys, so I did it alphabetically. So first, that would be Ben Rush Elementary School. Come on down. All right, so I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Megan Bernicki. I'm an EL teacher and administrative intern at Ben Rush Elementary. Um, and this is Lucy Davis, who also supported this work. Um, so first, I just want to thank Lake Washington School District for making this grant possible. Um, this grant allowed us to implement culturally responsive family engagement strategies that really complemented the work that we're doing around culturally responsive teaching. This year, we were able to do um, a, a lot of home visits. We had 12 teachers participate in home visits. We hosted the family panel, which you saw in the video, and we had over 40 staff members attend that. And then just last week, we hosted a community game night at a local apartment complex where many of our students live, and we had over 45 students and their families attend that. And so beyond what we did this year, I'm really excited for how this is changing, how our staff at Rush is thinking about family engagement and making plans for next year already. We have staff already talking about um, starting home visits earlier on in the school year next year. Um, a lot of teachers have reflected on how the questions that we asked at the family panel can be used during conferences. And staff and our PTA are looking at ways to do more events out in our community at other apartment complexes nearby. So thank you to Lake Washington School District for this grant, and it's really exciting. Thanks. Is anybody here from Ella Baker? Oh, oh, come on up. <laughs> I tease them that there's a secret stipend to get your staff to come to a board meeting. Um, hi, I am Kim Belanco, and I am so fortunate to be the principal at Ella Baker Elementary. And again, we also want to thank uh, Lake Washington School District per, for providing an innovation grant to help support our students, our staff, and our community. At Ella Baker, as you could have seen in that video, um, our mission is empowering change makers who know themselves, know how to get along with others, and also make a positive impact on our world. This grant has truly allowed us to realize this mission. We are so proud of the work that our staff is doing and we're excited to share the positive impact that this innovation grant has had on our school. So what is an integrated service learning unit? You might be wondering. What we did before the school year began in September, each grade level team met together to dig through all of our science and social studies standards. When we were digging through those standards, we found some common threads that wove throughout, and we thought those may be our themes for our units. Um, once we found the themes for our units, we found an authentic need in our community, and our students helped us do that. So we found um, first grade, for example, they studied birds, and we just realized that we built this school in an amazing bird habitat. And so there was their problem. What can we do to help rehabilitate the bird habitat, right? Um, so we have this guiding question, and it really is the foundation for all of the work that we're doing with our students in these integrated service learning units. Um, our, my favorite thing about the service learning units is that they are really engaging and students are really empowered to make a change in their community, authentic work that they're doing. Our grant had many outcomes we hoped to achieve. One was increasing family engagement, so we hosted a night called Shine the Light on Learning and our students presented their service learning projects to the community, and we had 89% of our families attend the event. We also were able to achieve our green school level one in our first year. Uh, when we surveyed our students, another outcome we were looking at is increased student engagement. 99% of our students reported that they enjoyed learning at Ella Baker and 89% of students reported that they enjoyed participating in the service learning units. Another outcome we were looking at was students being problem solvers and making an impact. 
93% of students reported that they believe they are a change maker and that they can make a positive impact on our school. One of the, um, this grant also gave students an opportunity to see their teachers and see what lifelong learning actually looks like in practice. Um, as you saw in the video, we had an expert come and teach us about project-based learning, taught us like the, all the components, what it looks like in other places, how we can apply that in our context, and also planning time right there with the expert to help us with the resources and the central questions and the guiding questions and the themes throughout the year to help us apply what we had just learned. Um, and we have a great admin leadership at our school who helps support us teachers taking risks. Um, and one of the components of project-based learning is student voice. And so teachers go through and plan. However, a student may take in the first few weeks of what we plan and take it in a totally different direction. And that's a risk of project-based learning is that you go where the students want to go, not necessarily where you thought they would go. That leads really well into the empowerment piece because as student voice is taken into account, we've got staff who feels comfortable um, flexing as needed to meet the needs of their students. We've got students who feel like they make a real difference in our school. Our kindergartners learned about the importance of play and advocated for like rainy day recess toys and even built a few for us. Our fourth graders tackled idling in our pickup zones. They wrote grants to Ms. Polanco for permanent signage. They developed their own uh, educational courses for K-5 to raise awareness and our fifth graders done some great work around starting our garden for next year, researching compost, again, um, working on their own grant writing to have our first compost bin where they actually had to make some changes at the district level to make it allowed. So we have some kiddos who really feel like they can make a difference and staff that feels like they have the flexibility and the support to have their back. Service learning also allows us to integrate social emotional learning in a very authentic way. Uh, the two work in tandem. And service learning is the perfect avenue for teachers to pre present SEL in an organic way so that it's not taught in just isolation. Uh, students have to practice character traits in order to work towards a common goal and exercise those cooperative group work skills. Service learning ensures that SEL traits become habitual and not just something that we talk about with students. So thank you again for helping us um, be innovators. Our staff and our students have really taken risks um, and they were really innovative in just our first year as a school. We believe that Ella Baker, our namesake and civil rights hero, would be proud of our school today. She lived her entire life working to help youth find their voice and also to become their own advocates. And at Ella Baker, we too are empowering change makers. And to not just take our word for it, we have a few people that wanted to tell you the impact that this grant has had on me. I'm Michaela and I'm a change maker. I am a change maker. I am Isaac, I am a change maker. Hi, I'm Melody and I'm a change maker. We're change, We're change makers. makers. I am Miss Johnson and I am a change maker. Hi, I'm Joshna and I'm a change maker. I'm Kenzie and I'm a change maker. I'm Max and I'm a change maker. I'm Lexi and I'm a change maker. I am Mrs. Belanco and I am a change maker. We are Ella Baker. We are change makers. Thank you very much. And last but certainly not least, join me in welcoming Finn Hill Middle School. I, well, I grabbed their, their script, so. Because yeah. <laughs> I don't have the video, but at least I look well prepared right now. <laughs> well, I'm Victor Scarpelli, the proud principal at Finn Hill Middle School, and we, on behalf of all of our science department, would like to thank uh, the Innovation Grant Committees and all of us who helped participate in writing the grant. And now I'm gonna introduce to you the awesome teacher who is implementing the first stages of our grant, Mr. Mark Clausen. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, we, we don't have a video, sorry. <laughs> and, and I just have to say thank you so much once again for the innovation grant money. Um, the ability to go from high school, I taught at Eastlake for the first 18 years, and then also at Best, which is now uh, Emerson for five years, to go to middle school 
and then recognize the fact that you don't have the toys that you had when you were teaching physics in high school. And so uh, part of the next generation science standards is those shifted and all of a sudden required kids to get more data, to create their questions, to do the modeling for that, and then you don't have the tools to actually get accurate data. Um, kind of defaults that purpose. So this is a chance to create some curriculum with some equipment to, uh, like the toys we had back in physics, to look at accelerations, look at the change in, in velocity and the change in kinetic energy, and then also uh, shift this over to uh, this wonderful thing called uh, space and where we look at uh, planets. We look at the same thing of modeling what they think is going on, modeling what they, they perceive and uh, see how well it works. But for me, that's when it's gonna actually set in. That's where they remember this and uh, they also remember how to do something uh, rather than us giving it to them all the time. So uh, I look so forward to this and, and thank you so much. It's just, it's really exciting for me to spend my summer making a bunch of curriculum. <laughs> no charge, no charge, no stipend, no stipend. Thank you guys. Thank you. Um, again, uh, Thank you to each of the schools and the grant recipients and all of your hard work. Uh, you're all amazing and you've all done amazing work. So thank you for your effort you've put into it and it's my extreme pleasure just to showcase it. So thank you uh, members of the board and Dr. Stable. I would just like to also take the moment to say thank you for all of you being willing to put in those grants and implement it and really make some changes and some exciting things are happening. Those are all very fabulous projects and looking forward to seeing even more coming out of that as this goes forward. So thank you for your energy and enthusiasm and sharing that with the students, it's fabulous. So we'll go on at this point, I believe, to our next recognitions. We will go on. We have lots of wonderful recognitions tonight. Our next one comes from our State Board of Education and our Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction as they honor Lake Washington schools and they are categorized as state recognized schools for high achievement and closing gaps. So let me tell you just a little bit about this because this is new. Over the past year, the State Board of Ed and the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction and the Educational Opportunity Gap Oversight and Accountability Committee, I think that's as many uh, letters in an acronym as I have seen for a while, but it is known as the E-O-G-O-A-C, in case you hear that referenced. They work together to revise the Washington State School Recognition System to more equitably recognize schools. And this is something that you'll see kind of across the nation. Some of this is related to ESSA um, in terms of having a growth factor in recognitions. So this spring in the first phase of the new state school recognition system, 216 schools statewide are being recognized which have demonstrated exemplary performance or who have made significant progress closing opportunity and achievement gaps in the Washington School Improvement, uh, Improvement Framework. Measures. 11 of those 216 schools come from the Lake Washington School District and we are very proud of them for this recognition. If you think about all of the schools that there are district wide, um, 216 is not a lot and to have 11 of those slots is, is pretty amazing. So they are not all with us here tonight. We wanna just mention them tonight and um, may bring them in for recognition in the fall. But we just got this and wanted to make sure we were able to announce this before the end of the school year since we only have one board meeting remaining in June before we kick up the new year in August. So those schools are Blackwell Elementary, Discovery School, Environmental and Adventure School, Explorer Community School, Frost Elementary, International Community School, Juanita Elementary, North Star, Rosa Parks Elementary, Stella Scola, and Wilder Elementary. So let's give them a hand so that they know how much we appreciate them. And as we all know, there are multiple factors that go into that kind of an achievement. It takes um, targeted work. It takes very purposeful work over time. And we know that that is happening throughout our district. So it's a pleasure to recognize these schools and the work of all of our schools tonight. Thank you very much. All right, so that actually ends the first part of our recognition piece. Um, and now we're gonna move into public comment. And I have two individuals who are currently signed up. And just as a quick reminder that the board does value with the community and hearing directly from you all. Um, and there are multiple ways to share your comments. This is only one. 
You can do it through emails, phone calls, letters, or personal meetings. And I will just say thank you all very much for coming in this. That's fine. Feel free to leave. You have a busy day tomorrow. Um, and on a regular basis, the Board of Director provides this opportunity for the public comment. Please note it's not question or answer session with the board, and we will not be able to respond to community members as we hope to listen and learn from you. Um, but we are committed to ensuring a response to your comments. If you have any written documentation, please feel free to provide it to us. Um, and from that, each individual is provided up to three minutes, and it's important for all community members to feel welcome and safe during the board's business meeting, so we do not take public comments on issues related to personnel or individually named staff at board meetings. When your name is called, please approach the podium, speak into the microphone, give your full name and school attendance area for the record, and we have a stoplight system which will show you a yellow light with one minute in red that signifies that your three minutes are over, and please try to wrap that up at that time. So the first person we have signed up this evening is Tanya Dempsey. There she is. So please come forward. And if you can give us your name and your attendance area, and then we'd love to hear your comments. This is uh, hard to follow up with great students and teachers. Here I am. I'm scared. Um, but I'm going to be a change maker, I hope. And so I'm here. I was inspired. Um, so I'll start off kind of oddly as we are ending the year with the beginning of the year. And I reached out to um, the board at the beginning of the year. I am celebrating the start of school for my high school and middle school students. We've completed our back to school shopping, crossed off the last of the items on the school supply list. I've purchased my student body cards, my yearbooks, P uniforms, PTSA membership, and all of this check writing and form signing and paying for school related items. I continue to wonder why Orca youth cards aren't included in this list of options. King County Metro and local school districts need to form better partnerships for students and families to easily access ORCA youth cards. Snail mailing a three-page form and $5 does not equal access to transit. So that was in September of 2018, and here we are in June, and there has been progress, and I am very grateful for that. ORCA to go has been in Redmond. It's also in Kirkland, um, but more to be done. Um, there is a lot of synergy with providing access to youth ORCA cards in schools, sustainability, connecting communities, equity, educational opportunities, climate impact, and health and wellness. Um, I feel the power of schools. We saw it, or I, I saw it here tonight with this incredible students that are graduating, going on to do great things, and also teachers. Um, things happen in schools in a way that don't happen when an individual goes to a city hall or a body to get a card. Um, 1,250 Lake Washington students get ORCA cards from an equity standpoint an educational opportunity standpoint, we need to make sure that all our students have that access. And lastly, um, just finished Grit by Angela Duckworth, and uh, love it when you're feeling passionate about something and it hits you right there. Um, students who are able to participate in two years of after-school activities show, uh, are better impacted for success in life. Um, and for my own daughter who attends a school in Seattle, um, having this ORCA card has meant that she's been able to do ultimate, which she's never done before. Um, her sense of self-esteem, her sense of health, um, and her friendships were directly impacted. Do I still have time? Yes. Okay. Uh, just an elected official in Kirkland fessed up to me. Tanya, how do you get a youth ORCA card. I just bought my three Lake Washington School District students full fare cards. It shouldn't be like that. Oh my gosh, that was so fun. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And so our next person we have signed up is Tamara Hill. And I apologize if I mispronounced your first name. It's okay. It's Tamara Hill. Um, hello, board members of the board, Dr. Stavum, 
thank you for this time, and um, wow, tonight was really cool coming here and seeing all those students get those awards, and then the staff, all the uh, innovative awards that they were just awesome. Um, I work here at the Resource Center in Intervention Services. Um, as we mentioned at our last, at your last meeting, and I say we as in the LWES um, union, we, um, excuse me, it is very hard. <laughs> we've, we've started our McCleary bargaining and tonight we wanna share some comments from some of our members so that we can share the importance and impact of our nego negotiations. One member wrote, and the question was asked, how, how would a pay increase affect my life? And the response was, I would be able to afford after school activities for my kids. I would not have to live paycheck to paycheck. Buying new shoes for my kids wouldn't be a major financial decision. I would be significantly less stressed out and can do my job better. Another shared her concerns about the difficulty of living in the community we serve. Higher cost of living is not exclusive to teachers. Thank you for your time and your hard work and this evening, and we look forward to reaching a fair and equitable resolution to our bargain. Bargaining. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who didn't get a chance to sign up that would like a time to speak? Okay, seeing none, then I will close the public comment at that point in time. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so now we will move on to our consent agenda. And I will now entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move approval. Second. It has been moved by Director Carlson and seconded by Director La Liberty. Dr. Salem, would you pull the board? I will. Cassandra. Yes. Eric. Yes. Chris? Yes. Mark? Yes. Siri? Yes. And Dr. Saban, if you could do us the favor and review the donations, please. I will. This month we have, or this week I should say, we have donations from our PTSA in the amount of $95,975.09. From private sources, we have an amount of $21,175.62 for a very generous grand total of $117,150.71, which we greatly appreciate. Absolutely, thank you very much for those donations. Our next step is to move on to the non-consent agenda. Um, and this evening, we have two of our 14 executive limitation policies. Um, and through these policies, the board established its values about how the school district is expected to operate and express conditions that must exist as business is conducted. As a reminder, we are updating these policies to ensure they re best reflect our values and we'll finalize these in the next few months. So tonight, these have not been revised and this is following our prior discussion. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Stavum to do a quick summary on EL2, EL12, oh, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. asset protection. So I'll just go quickly through the compliance um, and give you a brief summary of the entire report. Um, EL 12, of course, is um, the policy that basically keeps things in our district. It's people, it's things. Um, I'll focus on six main areas on how we use and maintain the assets of the district with as little risk as possible. The report addresses insurance coverage, maintenance strategies, legal protection, storage, and basic descriptions of systems to carry out those assurances. So in section one, which is uh, focusing mainly on insurance coverage maintained by the district for asset protection from theft and from casualty losses. I find this section to be in compliance. Section two focuses on liability coverage related to staff members. I find this in compliance with no change from last year on this particular section. Number three, this section focuses on bonding of employees who interact with district funds. This is in compliance with no change from last year. Section four covers district protection from legal liability and the strategies in practice that reduce our risks. This section also is found to be in compliance with no charge or change from last year. 
Section five is uh, protection of intellectual property and items that are inventoried and considered tangible or fixed assets. Again, this is in compliance with no change from last year. Um, I won't spend a, a lot of time on it, but I will say intellectual property is something that continues to change and um, grow in complexity as we um, look at what's created, what's put out there on the web, what's done during regular school time, what's done on someone's own time but used at school. And so um, that's an area that we'll continue to pay particular attention to. Uh, let's see, which one did I leave off on? Section four. Sorry, I've got to see which section I left off on. Uh, section, well, we're gonna start, no, section six, sorry. They all looked like something I had not said, but did say. Section six, this covers a preservation and disposal of records related to district business in accordance with record retention requirements imposed by the state of Washington. Again, this is in compliance with no change from last year. Um, I will say during the 1920 school year, we talked about this just minimally, but um, I'd like to conduct a review of our existing records that I think probably require some archival assistance and see what we can do to get those in the right place. I know from um, being in a district that had a pretty significant fire, those are things that we would not want to lose with any kind of damage and just wanna make sure that we preserve the history of our district well and that we are also following good practices for records retention. So um, that'll be a project for next year. That does conclude EL 12, which I find to be in compliance. And so I'll open up for any questions that you have or comments to Jane to speak to any clarification or anything on the executive limitation in the report. Seeing no. none, I will move to approve, request a motion to approve as presented. Yes, exactly. Move approval of the report as presented. Second. And so with that, I will then open it up for any discussion around the compliance, anything there, any comments? I, I appreciate the joy of trying to preserve the records on a posterity basis. I know we're already in compliance on the legal definition of discovery, but uh, I like that idea, mm -hmm. so thank you. One thing to keep in mind too is every time we open a new school, we just open a new school's worth of new assets. And so if you think about that from a management um, position, that's that just, increases that burden over time, so it's a lot to keep track of. Okay, with that then, I see no further discussion. We'll take a vote on the motion, and the motion is to approve the executive limitation as presented. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, it has been approved as presented. Thank you very much. So with that, we will now move on to executive limitation 14, technology. And so if you could present that. I will, this one is a little bit more extensive report and I won't get into all of the, the details because there is a lot here. So um, hopefully you'll take time and do this because there's just a lot of work on the technology side. The same is true as we open new buildings. We're also increasing the load on our networks, uh, the number of uh, computers, the number of users, all of that just increases exponentially as we continue to grow. So we'll just go through this section by section. Uh, section one focuses on the components of the district technology plan which operationalizes our strategic work necessary to support the school district. This section is found to be in compliance with no change from last year. Just a couple of things I would mention that there's really been some significant work completed around that infrastructure piece and um, the systems that help us manage all of our users and all of the, the backside, if you will, of technology. Um, we also have um, been launching the district-wide initiative to streamline the use of our digital platforms. And this is a pretty significant item. It allows us to leverage our existing tools more powerfully as well as adding clarity to district expectations for the appropriate use of technology to support instruction. 
And that is no small feat considering everything that's out there to use. How do we make sure that we're using the things that we um, have at our disposal well, the things that are part of our systems, as well as allowing for good systems that allow people to bring things to us and say, hey, this is something that I think would be supportive of the work that I'm doing in my classroom or has an educational value. Section two. This section focuses on technology infrastructure that supports staff, students, and the community. This section is also found to be in compliance with no change from last year. The district continues to build out our network to provide the level of coverage needed on a daily basis. This work grows increasingly complex as we also ensure compliance with state and federal regulations and accommodate a growing number of users. Section three. Section focuses on aspects of current district data that's accessed for many purposes and has to be accessible to the appropriate users. This is in compliance with no change from last year on this section. And I think this is um, one of those areas where as you continue to have requirements for what's reported, we also grow in our capacity to use that data for some really important things. Um, and if you look at the list on page 11 of the report, you can see that there is just um, no small amount of data that is tracked and that we're responsible for. So that aspect of district management has just grown tremendously, I would say even over the past three years as we um, both want data and are required to keep data on a variety of things. Section four covers descriptions of processes and tools used to ensure a secure user environment in compliance with privacy laws and regulations. This area is found to be in compliance with no change from last year. Mm -hmm. Student data privacy is a primary responsibility of our district and measures continue to be upgraded and refined. This is an area that requires ongoing monitoring as the attempts to access data by outside user grows. This will be an area that will require ongoing support which may indicate a need for additional staff as well over time. And I like to say that, um, you know, how as you add an app or as you download software to your computer and it says click agree if you wanna continue downloading and we typically just click on it and hope for the best. Well, we actually have to have someone who reads all of those things and make sure that the things that we use in our school district are in compliance. And when we see um, evidence daily of data breaches and things like that, we just take that responsibility very, very heavily um, in terms of keeping student data privacy and all of the surrounding systems that have to help us kind of keep the, the right people able to access things in the wrong people from um, getting at our district data. So that is the nutshell version of a very extensive report that shows um, evidence of ongoing work over a number of years. And at the same time, we're continuing to move forward with things like our fifth grade adoption next year of uh, computers for our fifth grade students and know that, again, that adds kind of another layer of users to the system as well as things that we are um, dreaming about in the future as we've put smart boards in our schools and we continue to add uh, innovation to allow for the things that our groups um, talk about when they present to the board. It's just a, an ever growing kind of a, of a structure that we have to be able to support. And I don't know, I think I speak for everybody in this room every now and again when our computers might go down even for a fraction of a, a minute, sadly enough, but even five minutes, 10 minutes, which really does not happen very often at all. We all kind of sit at our desk and wonder what we're supposed to do because everything that we have is so tied. That being said, we also have to make sure that we are conscious of the user experience out in our schools. And as we add those tools for um, our students, we have to make sure that things work. And we have some geographic uh, challenges for connectivity sometimes. And we have um, older buildings, we have newer buildings, and some of the work we have to go back in and do uh, has to happen alongside of what's happening with our rapid construction where there's brand new things going in. So it's just, it's just a continual picture of maintenance that's required to keep everything humming along in our district for technology. So that concludes that report on EL14, which I find to be in compliance. Any questions? I have one. Yes. When you speak about the access to the internet, as we begin to com 
build in more things at all the online things that you have to do both from a parent side as well as the student side. How are we ensuring that our families also have access to the internet in which we, Skyward you have to have access to. So that's been a piece as you look at that infrastructure. How are we taking that into account? Yep, we've talked about that. There have been some um, low cost solutions that the district has helped to purvey for families. We've talked about hotspots and other ways that we might be able to provide that um, at home. We also try to provide alternatives so that a student may not be dependent upon internet at home to do a particular assignment. Um, I have not explored this um, piece of it, but many communities partner very closely with their libraries, and I just know living close to um, one of our King County libraries, there is a high level of use there, which I know is related to accessibility there. But that's something that we need to think about as we look at closing that achievement gap. Does everybody have access to what they need when they're asked to do work that we have assigned, as well as wanting to have persistent access, just like we would want for any child to explore and to do what they would typically be doing in their homes. So I think that's a, an item as we look at our strategic plan, as we look at our revised policy interpretations, what is it that we really want to accomplish? And probably one of the first steps is really reevaluating where we are with the need. I know the district has done some work in the past few years of kind of trying to determine where the needs are, and that's kind of a moving target because I think one of the things that's interesting is if you ask if people have access to the internet, they'll look at their phones and say, well, yes, they have access to a phone, but that's not the same, although you will see high school students typing papers on their phone, which blows my mind. But um, that's different than persistent access for things and for parents to be able to go in and look at our information, to be able to do some interactive things maybe, and to be as robust as we would want it to be for a child in their home. I have one more question. Um, on data privacy, you had mentioned that. The other component, it's, it's our data that we collect. And there, I know there's a lot of systems that our, our students put information into. Mm -hmm. I think of career cruising. How do we ensure that that data privacy, if that gets changed, hands or anything, or archived, how does that work through the system? Mm -hmm. Because it ends up in multiple places, different staff, you get requests to put information in. So that's, as we go to this cloud-based system, how are we ensuring that that data privacy is working? Mm -hmm. And I'm certainly not the expert on that, but whenever we have a, a vendor partner who is somebody that's going to touch our data, there are certain compliance measures that have to be met before we will even consider having them as a partner. And sometimes it depends on where the data lives, if it lives in our system, and that comes up. Sure, come on up, John. If that they come to us to get that data and how it flows between the entities and back, um, and it is in some of the um, ways that students sign in and how the identifiers work there, which are often not based on name, but might be on a specific identifier that would not be able to be used to identify specific things about a student, but are used to just be kind of attached to their student information. John, you can talk a little bit about it. So just a couple points to add. Uh, we work with legal counsel in very great detail around all of our, uh, all of the legal language to make sure that we get down to the very finite details to understand um, what are the applications that our students are using and what, what happens with the data. And if they're using or sharing that student data, then that is an application that is not allowed to be used in our system. We also have a periodic review of all of our applications that are actually approved. Uh, we just uh, finished a cycle for a handful of applications, just informed the system that two of those no longer met compliance, took them out of the system. And so it is, it is always a constant cycle of review if we want to bring a new application in, but it's also that review of anything that's in the system because they can update their policies and we're accountable for it the moment they update it. And so it's that constant review and making sure that we have the technical expertise in-house to do that and that uh, our legal counsel has the expertise as well to be able to support us in that. We also have any time a staff member wants to use a digital application, we have a very thorough process to make sure that it's educationally sound and legally compliant for the different age groups that it wants to be used for. Director Carlson. So um, I'm 
generally pleased with this, but there's one particular realm where I'm still yearning for help, and that is, as a board member, part of part of my job is to be able to explain simple things like enrollment rates and stuff to the community. Um, and, you know, uh, there are things that change over the years, but, you know, fundamentally there are things that are simple that I had access to up until 2016-17. Um, we're now into the 2018-19, so we're two years out of date. Um, I can't access directly how many AP exams have been taken. I can't access directly the graduation rates, the demographic parameters, how many kids are in ELL, ELL um, little things. Um, but really important things to keep a finger on the pulse of our district. How many, I mean, one of my favorite factoids is how many of our elementary schools this year have less free and reduced lunch than Medina Elementary. Usually it's one or two, but um, I can't do that myself. And I don't like having to ask help to do that. Um, so anyway, uh, I currently on my Power BI portal, for those of us who are on the board, we have three things that we can see, and then we have, to my intense frustration, a whole bunch of things we are shown, but then are told, no, you can't see that. Um, it is great to have us have access to the three things we can see are the ER reports for ELA, math, and science. The things I cannot see are the student, anything on the DLT dashboard. I can't see your student growth percentiles. That's something that's important to us. I can't see your AP exams. I can't see your graduation rates. I can't see your demographics. I don't care about your attendance. But, you know, stuff that I should be able to see at a building level, I can't right now. I'm just saying that because if we get to next year at this time, I will be saying this is out of compliance if the board can't see all of these things. Um, this year I'm simply going to wave on, but I'm letting you know that I'm tired of waiting um, for permission to see any data that I used to have access to. So, yeah. And, and honestly, I don't work in Power BI that often because those results come to us through our directors, but I know we have scheduled in your annual work plan at the very beginning of next year a session with Tim Krieger. And so I think that's an opportunity then. I, I don't go in and look at what level the board has access to, but my understanding was some of that was moving along, so we'll check on that. And I think at that point, he can give you the how-to and we'll see what we can have access. What I don't know is how that plays with the conversation we just had about the, the user access and data privacy. So right. I think the dashboard factor is what you're referring well, and that's to. That's something where the data privacy, I, I appreciate data privacy, but when it comes to a board member asking questions to the data, that's a different standard. Stuff we're exposing to the external stuff, you have to worry about data privacy. If you give us a as a board member, I can see that there's one kid. That's not my point, but if I can't see anything where there's less than 10 kids, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna be able to see how many Quest kids are in each grade level from each school. Right. I need to be able to see that, because I need to be able to say, how many kids from this school are in the Quest program? Is it proportional or disproportionate? Do I feel like equity is being met? That's a simple question for me to ask, and it doesn't require any worry about privacy. That's part of our board policies on how the board will govern. We're going to be respectful of that data. We're not going to be using it externally. But in terms of interaction with you, I, it, it, I've got far too many gatekeepers. And I, the other reason I'm just saying this a little bit more aggressively than usual is about every time that I see something around technology, which I think has happened three times over the last quarter, I send a bunch of emails asking for request access to these bleeping reports. And I have not gotten any action on access to any of the DLT reports. So I'm feeling stonewalled, even if that is not the intention. I will check into that. Yes. And we will then also set on the work plan to have to make sure that access is there, because I think that's most likely an access issue that you just haven't been whatever reason, and that's just working through the system as we implement this in. Does that make sense? OK. Oh, no, I, I, yeah. So anyway, I'm just letting you know. And I expect progress by September. <laughs> Any other questions or clarification? No. With that, then I will entertain a motion to a move a approval of the report as presented. Thank you. Second. second. It has been moved by Director Carlson and seconded by Director Sage. Um, any further discussion around compliance? I think Dr. Carlson's remarks was sort of one of them. I was actually going to highlight the piece that. 
I had thought the work in the Power BI and the implementation of it throughout our system has been highly valuable. And to commend that work that's been going and being able to set that up through the school and the district and have a really clear line. There's still some implementation challenges, it appears, and, and those are to be worked out in the near future. So I would say kudos on that work. I was going to say, uh, I can see a lot on power, but maybe you're having the problem that we had when we had the first training session, yes. that there were some things we could see and some things we couldn't see, and maybe the things that we couldn't see haven't, haven't availed themselves to you. I, I, That's why I was a little bit looking because I was thinking that some had accessed some of those things. So I think we need to check on That's uniformity we might, of that. We might just have a, yep. a glitch. I think it's a user disconnect, yeah. access. So I don't think it's beyond that. Well, that it's a user problem, but if it's a user error, it's still your problem. Oh, no, I mean it's a check mark. <laughs> they got to check a different box. OK. <laughs> Any other questions <laughs> or any other comments on the report? Any other further discussion around compliance? And if we're, we're good? All right, so from there, we'll take a vote to approve the motion as presented. All those in favor? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? With that, EL 14 has now passed as presented. Thank you very much. So the last thing of the monitoring that we have on this is for ENDS Results 1 on the mission and vision. Um, we had resent, I sent out the assertion of progress with exceptions based on the discussion from the last meeting in the draft. You should have all have seen that. Um, and so from there, it's if there's any further discussion as to what they're basically that, that report is saying that we Agree that the report has seen reasonable progress with noted exceptions um, that are written there specifically. And those exceptions are some of the enrollment increasing for dual credit courses, such as earning a B has not shown the same results as we saw for actual enrollment in the course, and that would be one of those exceptions. Overall achievement has opportunity for improvement in relation to ranking, specifically in certain subgroups. Um, that'd be low income special education and our racial subgroups. And post-secondary has seen some decline with subgroups, especially African American. Those were some of the areas that were exceptions. On the other end of those that we agreed reasonable progress, the graduation rate has improved across the board up to 93.6%. That's an increase of 3.4% in the last five years. Also did it across the majority of the subgroups in there. Um, dual credit enrollment has increased to 91.4, and that post-secondary enrollment within two years of graduation for all is at 83.6. So really solid progress in those areas and with those other areas on which to focus. So any discussion on that or questions of what is there? Any amendments that need to be made to it or changes? Okay, so with that I will entertain a motion to approve as presented. Uh, move approval of the ER1 mission and vision monitoring report and assertion of progress and exception form as presented. I second that marvelously fluent statement. <laughs> it has been moved by Director La Liberty and seconded by Director Carlson to approve the report as presented. Any further discussion? Okay, and with that, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right, with that, the motion carries. So thank you very much. Excellent work in being able to move the graduation rates and a lot of good work. And we look forward to the future work together on that. So with that, we now have next on the agenda is the board policies of governing culture and board superintendent relations. What I would like to recommend there is, does anybody have, briefly discuss this at the study session as to if there were any changes. Um, there were not any in the reading through that. So does anybody have any further discussion on these? If not, I'd like to propose that Cassandra and I will meet with Dr. Stavum to just sort of review those small changes that were there to bring it back to the board for a second reading. Is that sort of an okay suggestion? So, Sounds excellent. So I've only got one bigger picture piece, not getting into the nitty gritty of any of this, because if there's anything I hate participating in, it's word smithing. So you're welcome to that. Um, but the, um, there is a distinction between policies and there are a couple things that are processes that are embedded inside of policies. And I think that you already, your notes, comments on them had acknowledged that, that sort of in GC10, that that's really, that's all process, it's not policy. Um, and if we were, if we were going to create a, an, sort of an adjunct set of things, 
it's still important for them to be linked closely so that you can find them without stumbling into them. Um, and the only one where I felt like there was actually something important to be, I mean, there are three of them. It was GC7E, GC9, and GC10 had big pieces of process, board conduct violations, board acceptably used policy. Those ones, yes, let's punt them into some other document. Totally supportive with that. Um, it's GC10 on the, uh, <laughs> curiously enough, the technology resources, if I recall correctly, um, where I think we can just put in a one sentence um, instead of having this board member use of electronic resources. <laughs> Curiously enough, we're discussing that. Um, where, that as policy, I think it would be reasonable for us to just have a policy that says board members will abide by the same acceptable use policy as is applied for district administrators. And then that lets us use the same AUP language. We don't have to worry about separate amendments, et cetera. Um, just keep track of it in one place. Yeah, so, that's so we'll look at taking that out, just getting one. rid of GC10 completely yeah. and building it into. But other than that, no, I really don't have much okay. to say about these. They're, your, your, your amendments are all reasonable. So I'm, I'm behind you guys on whatever edits you want to add. Okay, so with that, that will be the first reading and we'll go ahead and move to, well, the second reading will be on the next board meeting and Cassandra and I will meet with Dr. Stabum in between that time to just finalize out a final copy for review. Okay, so with that, we will move to a program report and I will pass that again to you, Dr. Stabum. Yep, and we'll ask Barbara Posthumus, our Associate Superintendent for Business and Support Services to come up and um, Brian Buck is joining her operations to give us a facilities update. Good evening, how are you? I'm gonna let Brian start us off tonight, and then I'll step in. Okay. So this is our Building on Success program. Uh, just a reminder, we have eight projects. Um, we have three new schools, Baker and Barton Elementary, which are occupied, and we have Timberline Middle School um, opening up in the fall. In addition, we have uh, three rebuild and expand projects, Mead Elementary School, Kirk Elementary School, and Juanita High School Phase One. And in addition to that, we have the Explore Community School and the Old Redmond Schoolhouse, which will now open fall of 2020. Uh, here's the aerial of Juanita High School. Uh, just a quick note, the new construction there, uh, which is around the old building, is actually about over 13 months of work. They've been able to construct it and finish the interior. Uh, we expect to open that school uh, again the fall of 2019 for the first phase. Here's a, just a graph really of what the new campus uh, consists of. So accomplishments, um, biggest piece right now is the theater seating, flooring, acoustical paneling is complete as of May. Casework installation is complete. Uh, de uh, the demolition of the remaining building will occur in July and we expect occupancy by the end of July. Uh, here's another aerial that you can see the current building and the new building phase one. That, that little uh, swoosh there is the theater that comes out. Uh, and then the field house and pool that are on the, it looks like the west side there. On the right there is a picture of the interior of the library. And this is the picture of the main entry. Uh, big picture on the left is the theater. And on the top right is the band room. You can see that the uh, casework for holding all the instruments are starting to be installed there. And then the bottom right is um, a planter that's gonna have benches around it. So that's near the front of the school. Timberline Middle Schools. Sure. Yeah. 
Let's see if I have a picture of it. This wood here, uh, there's lots of reclaimed wood in Juanita. Uh, so the, these are custom seats in the uh, library there that are all reclaimed wood. We do not have a picture, I don't think, of the commons in the staircase that goes up into the library, but that's also all reclaimed wood. The wood is from the, the beams of the old school. So. All right, Timberline. So Timberline, uh, major accomplishments, they're paving both the bus loop and the tennis courts. Um, interiors are being finished in June. Um, the synthetic track will complete uh, in July. Again, occupancy by the end of June uh, with the school opening in the fall. Uh, here's an aerial here. You can see uh, the field and the track. Uh, paving's already starting and uh, nearing completion. Top right is a look at the main entry with the academic classroom wing on the left. And then here's a look at the academic wing from the main entry on the bottom right. Uh, on the left here is a reception area. Uh, that again is also reclaimed wood from the site. Um, I believe this is in the library on the left. On the bottom, um, bottom right, we have the new signage going into the building. Uh, this is the main office next to that, uh, which is also reclaimed wood. Uh, it's kind of a neat architectural feature that the brace framing here goes right through the counter of the, the office. Um, on the left, these are, this is a uh, staircase going upstairs and it uh, has the wood from all the trees uh, that are on site listed there. And then this is the graphic going from the commons uh, into the gymnasium. Peter Kirk Elementary, you can see from this aerial here how compressed this site is. They're building right on top of the old school there. Uh, major accomplishments so far, uh, masonry complete, uh, elevator installed, uh, upcoming, we got casework, flooring, interior doors and windows being installed in June. So quite a bit of work still left to go for Peter Kirk. Schools still on schedule open, clearly on the fall of 2019. Here is the uh, picture of the masonry going up. And the two pictures on the right are just the two pictures of the typical classroom. Here's Margaret Mead. Margaret Mead's about two weeks behind Kirk on the schedule. Um, again, this is a highly constrained site. You can see the uh, barrier wall. Uh, kids are out there playing on recess with the construction. Um, let's see, similar uh, roof complete in April, permanent power May, casework, flooring, interior doors and windows being installed in June. Here's another aerial. This is uh, this roof design that's coming from the academic wing over to the, the main office here. That was, all, that was actually a design that happened through the construction advisory committee to reduce the space that was, that was there. Uh, top right is the new bus loop, and then bottom right is the typical classroom. Old Redmond Schoolhouse. Again, where the opening is now fall of 2020. We'll begin uh, additional maintenance on the building envelope in July and August. And uh, let's see here, picture-wise, this is on the bottom, or the big picture here on the left is the interior side of the exterior wall. So we had to clear out, the, uh, clear out all the drywall and plaster to get to the exposed wall. Um, Top right is the framing for the new office. And then, um, and then there's a classroom wall, exterior wall right here. All right, just real quick, Barton um, is complete and occupied. 
So a contractor walk scheduled, uh, this is a one year warranty walk scheduled for July. And Baker, uh, primary same thing. We have some roof repairs due to snow damage. So uh, those repairs will go on in July, contractor warranty walk in July as well. And Explorer, this was the first project that was completed. And so we'll be, we're predicting to be closed out. Um, this, this says the project's <laughs> closed December 18th, but uh, we're still closing out the actual books on this project. Okay. So I'm gonna do a quick review as I always do at these reports on our cost update. Uh, so we monitor our costs uh, and spending on a regular basis. We have sold all our bonds, all of the $398 million in bonds, um, Just and our bonds uh, are assigned the highest credit rating to any school district. Only two other districts in the state have similar credit ratings. Um, so our program revenues to date, uh, we had planned for $429 million, and to date we have $423 million in revenues. That includes um, impact fees and interest earnings on our bonds. Um, on the expenditure side, we are have spent 302 million out of 429 million dollars, and we expect 80 percent of our program will be spent by the end of the school year, and that we still have funds to spend to complete Juanita High School and finish out Kirk and Mead. Um, so OSPI has approved our state construction assistance funding planned at $21 million for three schools, Kirk, Mead, and Juanita High School projects. We do get those funds at the end of the projects and we anticipate receiving those, those funds over the next two years. So continuing the communication on our bond e-news updates on a monthly basis, uh, uh, photography and video stories, Facebook Live, um, our annual ma mailer goes out in the fall each year. So I'm gonna pass it back to Brian to talk about our 20, we wanted to add to this report our um, update on our 2019 capital levy projects that were passed in April. Okay, so um, the projects we have are Lake Washington High School classroom edition and then the gym and commons edition along with the four elementary school additions, three of which are in Kirkland, along with uh, safety and security upgrades. So for Lake Washington High School classroom, um, let's see, let me highlight, bidding for the classroom addition began in March. Um, North parking lot construction begins in June. They're mobilized now at Lake Washington High School. Uh, we expect approval for the master use permit in June and the classroom uh, construction will begin in June. Uh, the Jim and Commons uh, schematic design is happening now. We expect to be completed in August. And here's a rendering of the, the classroom addition on the right, and it'll create a little courtyard between the main building and the existing performing arts center. Uh, for the elementary school classroom additions, uh, pre-design review has been going on since January. Uh, we have a GCCM, that's our general contractor construction manager selected, and we're um, analyzing the different site options available. We have a schematic design review with principals um, this week, and then design development begins in July. For safety and security upgrades, uh, we have the security cameras at the elementary schools along with the high school entry modifications. Uh, we have design development going on uh, at Lake Washington High School, the entry modification as part of the gym and commons expansion. And then design development is underway for the Redmond High School entry modification. And then the timing of these projects are kind of dependent on cash flow. Okay, so this is just a highlight of some of our summer projects. Uh, we categorize these um, into four different categories. 
along with technology. The building and safe is building systems and improvements. This includes roofing, and uh, we also have some uh, building controls going in at East Lake, and some exterior painting for um, athletic fields. We have some traffic improvements and some elementary um, playground installations. And for school and program improvements, we have some high school room conversions and new classrooms being built at East Lake, along with some uh, special services rooms. And for, let's see, code compliance. So we have a few fire life safety upgrades, some ADA improvements, and some security system upgrades as well. And then for technology, I don't have any specifics on the technology upgrades, but do you have any? Um, summer's our busiest time for a tech project. So we're doing, um, you know, we're updating our computers, getting ready for the fifth grade integration. Um, security cameras being installed potentially in our middle schools. I think that's we're getting continued work on and then continually upgrading our network and other equipment up, updates. So just a high level, wanted to make sure uh, we talked about what was going on with our uh, four year capital levy also. And then the last slide really is just everything, um, more information uh, is on our website and that is continually updated with prod updates on our projects. Any, question, any questions? I am not seeing any questions at this point in time. I have one, sorry. Um, so the question is, as we go through this, the one piece that I didn't see, and, and I haven't dug into that, and I know we see it through a multiple of different things in different places, is where we are at cost and sort of the schools we finished, did those finish on budget, mm -hmm. just sort of those pieces, it would be nice to sort of have that piece built in okay. of sort of where we're at, especially knowing mm -hmm. in this, that's just great information to be able to have there that people can see Great. as well. And we are still within our Absolutely. overall program budget and um, and as we close out, we haven't finished the close out of our elementary schools that have been completed, but once we have final close out, then we can report on the final uh, costs. Oh, that would be great. So yeah. it's at that close out time is when you're able to do that most Correct. effectively. Perfect. Right. Great, thank you. You're welcome. And there are no other questions, so thank you very much. It's sure. exciting all the things that are happening. Still a lot of work. Okay, so now our intendant report. Yeah, and I don't have anything specific tonight, but I got a picture this afternoon of a kindergarten class a teacher sent to me where they are sitting on the floor with their little graduation caps and it says, I present to you the class of 2031. And I just think that it it's always good at this time of the year, we have graduations coming up, which is really the pinnacle of everything that we are about. And we have to pause and think about just the things that we heard tonight, but as we're looking at our um, new version of our strategic plan that we will be um, implementing next fall and planning for how we continue to move our district forward, when you think of all the schools that have come on even just during my tenure, it's, it's really staggering. But with all of that busyness, it's what are we doing now that ensures a great outcome for those kindergartners when they walk across the stage, which I did a little bit of math and thinking how old I will be at that point and I would rather not think about that, but I should still be here, but you know, um, it's, it's really amazing if we looked back over the last 12 years, what things were like when our graduating seniors were kindergartners to where we are now. Um, I just think that, that it's um, the rate of change that we experience now the projects that we heard um, that are happening. I was here this weekend watching the students who were participating in the tech startup competition. It was unbelievable. And the uh, level of sophistication that kids are able to pursue now just because of the resources they have available anywhere, anytime, allows us to really dream big. And so we wanna make sure that we're providing a great foundation with great people and great learning environments um, just like we did for our graduating seniors as we're accounting for those incoming kindergartners and all of the planning and work that we have to do to keep this school district um, being as high achieving and really um, 
full of opportunity. We know that there's room to grow and we know that we have more work to do, but we have a lot to celebrate at this point in the year and a lot to do because we are trying to finalize um, many things in preparation for next year. So um, we'll also be transitioning a number of people at the end of June. We wanna make sure that we um, say thank you for all of their work if they're leaving our district at the end of the month and um, great appreciation for the way that they've impacted our schools and our students. And then we get to begin thinking about how we onboard new people and to get them up to speed. And I'm just very happy that I'm not one of them this coming year. So it's been a it's been a great year, and we'll look forward to one more board meeting this month. But a lot, lot uh, to celebrate as we look forward to graduation this next week. Just a quick kudos. Uh, some of the high school students are in their well, some ones getting ready to graduate are in their caps and gowns walking through elementary schools. Usually the elementary school that they went to, and I, I think they're also trying to hit the middle schools. And it just reinforces for those younger kids why they're there, what their purpose is. You're trying to get to this cap and gown. That means something. And where you go from there, there's endless possibilities. So it's always exciting to see those soon-to-be graduates walking through the elementary school. And with that, I have a legislative report that's on my agenda. Director of Liberty, anything to report at this moment in time? No. Okay. So there's there any follow-up from the board? Any future agenda items? Debrief, board member comments? I have one thing to say. I had the opportunity to go up to the Mead Open House. So this was a great opportunity that it was the, they're gonna be taking me down because the new school has been built. And so they had a gathering of over 900 people for their barbecue. And then you had the opportunity to go into the school and sign your name on the wall and write anything. And they had people who had been there 30 years ago who were coming back and going back to an old classroom or seeing another teacher or lots of high school students came back in which to go back into that school. So great idea to be able to bring that forward um, and give the opportunity for the community to say goodbye to the school and see the new one coming on the other side. So that was a great addition to the whole building of community in that environment. So great idea. So we're on debrief, right? Yes. Okay. Um, next year, if there's any way possible, let the PTSA know that we want to hobnob with the kids before the meeting. I'd love to get to talk to them instead of just have them presented to us. Um, but other than that, I'm very proud of the kids who sh and they were honored this evening. So, Yes, okay, any other board member comments? Okay. We're into graduation season and we all know our rules, right? I've, I, I got my memo, so. We all have memos, we have the graduation ceremonies. Yeah. It's great to be there. You've all had the, your tickets for where you need to go, so thank you very much. It's a great opportunity to see. It's the reason why we do the work we do here at the board. So our next board meeting will be held on June 24th at 5 p.m. We have a study session um, where we'll do the annual work plan as well as a review of the operational expectations and results, and then we have the 7 p.m. board meeting that night. So with that, I will now entertain a motion to adjourn. Move adjournment. Second. Been moved by Director Carlson and seconded by Director La Liberty that we adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by voting aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Meetings adjourned.